Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Daly. I spent 20 years with United Press International, most of it with the old UPI radio network. And my favorite assignment was going on the road producing and hosting American Montage. It was an hour-long weekly program. Now here's an edited version of one of those shows. If you look at maps of the North American continent from the 1700s, you see some familiar cities in the east, New York and Philadelphia, Boston and Charleston. But out in the Midwest, there isn't much of anything except rivers and mountains and a little spot called Vincennes, V-I-N-C-E-N-N-E-S. Originally a French trading post, a battle of the Revolutionary War was fought there. And it is where I spent 11 years of my broadcast career. So I thought it might be fun to go back to Vincennes, Indiana, and to talk about early American heritage, not just to find out about the city, but to help you, wherever you are, in small town or large, preserve the heritage you have there. I talked with Gus Stevens. Gus and I worked together in broadcasting, and now he is the curator of the Lewis Historical Library at the local college, Vincennes University. We started out by walking through downtown Vincennes and talking about the history of that great small Midwestern town. There are so many things to talk about in this town. I just noticed the sign now mentions the fact that Vincennes was started in 1732. That's right. Are there not very few undiscovered cities outside the East Coast that go back this far. Well, this is certainly the oldest town uh, in the Indiana Territory, which uh, consisted of the states of Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Illinois, and a part of Minnesota. And uh, it was started as a, a French fort here. We have documented proof. You know, it, it strikes me as being so funny in a way, but I guess everything gets anglicized. I don't know how to speak French, but I guess it's actually Vincent. It's a suburb of Paris. That's if right. If I'm not mistaken. That's and, right. And one of the most popular streets down here is Busserin, which is actually Bousseron. That's it's right. pronounced correctly. That's right. But of course, we moved everything over here and corrupted the pronunciation. And one of the most famous streets in town is Vigo Street, V I G O, which is for the Italian Francis Vigo. So we, uh, uh, the Italians get in the game here in Vincennes, too. Uh, Vigo was a very famous uh, uh, helper of George Rogers Clark in his march across the Illinois country to capture Fort Sackville. Uh, but mostly French in this community. Uh, Father Gibault is uh, another of the uh, uh, very early uh, uh, priests uh, that were into this country uh, west of the Alleghenies and north of the Ohio and uh, he was able to uh, uh, get the French people in Vincennes, and the town was uh, almost all French to, uh, uh, to support Clark's cause. So uh, Clark uh, only had to fight the British. He didn't have to fight the French, too, when he attacked Fort Sackville in 1779. But we do have some unusual uh, uh, street names. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we've maintained our traditions down through the years, and uh, uh, right now, we're approaching uh, what is uh, considered by many the largest uh, historical memorial outside of Washington, D.C., and that is the George Rogers Clark Memorial. We are on the banks of the Wabash River, and had it not been for that river, which was the interstate highway, the rivers were the interstate highway of the country at that time, the fort would not have been here because this was a main waterway. There's a huge, lovely bridge. If you've ever seen the Key Bridge in Washington, D.C., the style is very similar. And on the Illinois side, there's a marker over there to commemorate the fact that when Abraham Lincoln's family moved to Illinois, this is how they got there. Certainly did. 1842, they uh, crossed the Wabash here at, uh, at Vincennes. In fact, they spent the night here getting a, a wheel repaired on their wagon. They came from uh, Gentryville down here in southern Indiana. And, uh, of course, uh, once he got into Illinois, the rest is history. He made a pretty good name for himself. Well, now, there would not have been a bridge here then, would there? It would have been a no, ferry or a, a ferry Ford. And too, the, too deep for a Ford. And the ferry was only about 100 yards from where we stand right now. Let's see if we can cross the highway. This is um, just now a state highway. At one time, it was US 50. And uh, forgot how friendly everyone in the Midwest is. Uh, at, uh, at one time, this carried all the traffic east and west between Cincinnati and St. Louis through here. Yes, it did. And uh, also from Louisville to uh, Cahokia, Kaskaskia, the two major cities uh, in the whole area uh, before the uh, uh, French left, uh, before the British took over control of the area, were uh, Vincennes and Kaskaskia. Vincennes here on the Wabash, Kaskaskia over on the Mississippi. And there was a great deal of commerce and trade between the two cities. Gus, let's, let's turn around for a second and look back at Main Street. This was called Market Street 
as many towns have market streets, it was where commerce was, it looks down to where the ferry used to be across the river, it still says the Gimbal Corner there. You know, Dennis, that's one of the great, that's one of the world's great uh, mercantile success stories. 1842, a man came to Vincennes with a pack on his back, a Jewish peddler, selling out of his pack. He liked the community, decided to stay. He started his uh, little uh, store at the corner of 2nd and Main Street, which we're looking at right now, and that man's name was Adam Gimble. And uh, it wasn't too many years that he had a small store in Danville, and then he had one in Milwaukee, and then they decided to go to Philadelphia, then they decided to go to New York, and then they decided to buy five, Saks Fifth Avenue, and the Gimble brothers then were grown up, and they took over the corporation, and it became one of the world's great department stores, and it started right here in little old Vincennes, which we call the Old Post. With a, with a pack on a guy's back. With a pack on a guy's back. <laughs> I know, I went to an exhibit of maps at the Smithsonian a couple of years ago, and I was impressed by the fact that the very early maps of North America show the cities that we would expect to see on the East Coast. Charleston, which we forget was a much more important city at one time, Baltimore, Baltimore. New York City, those types of places. But then there's nothing out here except Vincennes and right. Kaskaskia, and that's right. it. They were the two major uh, uh, cities out on the, uh, on the frontier. Uh, many of the Indian tribes were still in the area, and uh, uh, in, in fact, basically into the 1800s, uh, they were still, through William Henry Harrison, the governor of the Indiana Territory, they were still having treaties with uh, the various Indian tribes. Well, now, let's move forward. We started in the, in the 1700s, and the French had a fort here, and it was named Vincennes. We are taking the long, long walk up to a monument, which is kind of a combination of the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial rolled into one. It dates from the 1930s, and as you mentioned, it's the largest monument to a single human being that's not in Washington, D.C. The Gateway Arch, of course, in St. Louis is larger, but it's not, not to one person. Bring us up to the revolution and tell us how out here in the prairie there was a battle that people have forgotten about. If well, not a battle, a takeover, I should say. Well, it, uh, it was a battle overnight, but, uh, but Clark seemed to uh, have the situation well in hand, and uh, Colonel Henry Hamilton, the uh, uh, governor of the British territory uh, out of Detroit, uh, surrendered on February the 25th, 1779. As you see, uh, etched in stone above the monument, conquest of the West, and that's what it's considered today, and uh, it was the only victory uh, that we had in that rather bleak winter of 1778 and 79, which you uh, might recall was when uh, George Washington was cooling his heels at Valley Forge, and uh, Clark was walking across the flooded Illinois country to attack the British here at Vincennes. We're not too far from the corner of Fifth and Main, and there's an old theater there called the Pantheon, which is now used as office space. This fellow, whose name I'm not going to say yet, I interviewed him one time, and he told the story. He was selling newspapers out in front of the Pantheon at Fifth and Main, was 10 years old. And he went in, and uh, he noticed that a comedian from New York was playing. And he went back out, and this fellow came in from out of town and said to him, what do you do for excitement? And the young newspaper boy says, well, there's a really funny guy from New York is going to be here. I'd really like to see him, but I don't have the money. And the young boy, now old, tells the story that the visitor bought all of his newspapers and gave him the money, and he went in and recognized that the fellow who had bought his newspapers was Ed Wynn. That's right. And that man was Red Skelton. That's right. And that's the Red Skelton. Uh, that's one of the more famous Red Skelton stories. Red Skelton was born here in Vincennes and grew up here in Vincennes. At a very young age, he, uh, uh, he was involved with uh, a number of uh, Midwestern acts, including uh, Clarence Stout's Minstrels. Uh, uh, he was with medicine shows. Uh, his success uh, speaks for itself. He's probably America's favorite clown and uh, Vincennes is very proud of him. I think one thing we do in Vincennes and we have a great school system here and uh, our teachers in Vincennes uh, use the resource of the people who are available uh, even the old guys like you and I uh, to come into the classroom and talk to the students and, and not so much tell them but to answer the questions they might have about uh, their community and what they perceive their community to be. And, uh, and I think that uh, this little old town of Vincennes does as good a job of that as, as any town I've ever heard of, of, of trying to interface the, their young people uh, with uh, the, the people who live in the community. And there you have it, another edited episode of one of the American Montage programs prepared for the UPI Radio Network back in the 1980s and 90s. I'm Dennis Daly. Thanks for listening. Thanks for going with me this week. And check YouTube for more American Montage programs.